Hey there, Emily from XY Advisor here with a quick introduction to this week's brand new podcast. Mark Hoven, CEO Wealth of Advisor Ratings, stopped by the studio to have a chat with Adrian Patty from XY Advisor this week. They actually had a really broad conversation, touching on Mark's impressive and rather non-linear professional career. A lot of what they discuss is also quite relevant to the recent release of the Royal Commission's final report. They touch on the number of advisors leaving the industry or switching licensees, and Mark actually highlights a really great question, which is part of the reason advisor ratings are now looking to roll out an initiative to rate licensees and not just advisors. They discuss the role and future of robo-advice, the current restrictions advisors are faced with in delivering their best work, and a classic Adrian question is tech the answer to all advisor problems? And sorry, no spoiler alert, you will have to listen for that answer. It's a well-rounded conversation with a healthy dose of humour, and we really hope you enjoy. So who is Sun Super? Well, if you haven't been living under a rock, then you've probably heard of them. But just in case you have been, they currently hold the salubrious title of being the only super fund to be named Fund of the Year by no less than five different rating organisations in one year including Champ West and Super Ratings. They've grown dramatically over the past few years and today have more than $58 billion in funds under management and 1.3 million members, making them the fifth largest fund in the country. These accolades and growth in part can be attributed to their strong and clear focus on delivering the best retirement outcomes for their members. And because they're a profit for members fund, all the profits go back into the business to improve the products and services they offer to clients, including registered financial advisors. In addition, their performance is strong. Their balanced investment option has outperformed the industry industry average over one, three, five, seven, and 10 years to the end of September. And to top it all off, they're a really great bunch to work with. So take the time to find a bit more about what they can offer you and your clients by visiting sunsuper.com.au forward slash advisor. Welcome to the podcast, Mark. Thank you. Good to be here. Oh, it's, uh, I think it's fantastic to have you on. We've, uh, we've been, um, I guess, sharing a lot of ideas about what's been going on in the industry over the last few months between XY Advisor, Advisor Ratings, and you guys are... You guys are doing some really cool stuff. Well, thank you. That's very kind. What do you want? <laughs> no, that's it. That's it. I was just trying to prep you up so you're happy to be in the in the interview. Now, you now I'll just beat up. you up through the rest of the, the forty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mike, like you've you've come through a bit of a journey, I guess, um, to get to this destination, which is quite different where you've been, where you are now. Done lots of things. Yeah, you talking about my. My uh, non-linear career path. Oh, well, I... Are you talking about advisor ratings, uh, short history? Well, I guess that's that's quite a non-linear path as well. <laughs> no, I'm talking about before that. So, like, yeah, some of the things you were doing before because you've yeah. been across various landscapes. Well, I... Yeah, I, gosh, I used to be an engineer. Yeah. Um, I used to be drilling oil wells in Bass Strait, you know, three, four, five kilometres under the, under the ocean floor. Um, very technical world. Diving? No, no, it was oh, okay. all from, from <laughs> you stay dry uh, on the platform, uh, drilling down through the uh, the ocean seafloor. But and were, um, was it dry and dry? Like no, there no were beers on the very, very dry. Yeah, yeah it was. Um, it was some time ago now. Um, back in the uh, in the old days, um, old technology. Um, and uh, yeah, things have changed a lot. But, uh, Do they but that still was have a, oil down there. Yes, not so much though. Okay. Not so much. Yeah, I I, I arrived. Uh, they call peak oil uh, mm-hmm. in Australia or Bass Strait at least. Um, <laughs> Australian peak I, oil. It was it was downhill <laughs> from the moment I arrived, and, uh, and <laughs> that's when the huge oil industry of Australia just started to descend. It, absolutely. Did it no, coincide 19, with global oil prices going down at the 19, same time? Or? Well, no, they'd been rising. Nineteen eighty-seven. Um, they stayed up, but. Uh, Peak oil. So um, there's only a dribble coming out of Bass Strait these days. Most of it's coming out of uh, other parts of Australia. Um, yeah. Oh, there's lots of dribble coming out of Australia. Yeah. <laughs> Depending on who you talk to. Yeah, that's right. uh, <laughs> so is that when you decided you had a bit of a pivot to another destination? Big pivot. Yeah. I um, so 10 years in the engineering industry, oil industry, and uh, and pivoted into financial services. It just looked a little more interesting, a little exciting. Um, and it was, you know, I, I jumped out of uh, engineering into stockbroking, sell side research, and, and that was, that was truly uh, the wild west. 
mm. com- compared to the safety, relative safety of a. Was that where the research got made up after you got told you had the IPO Ooh. something? Or? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I never crossed that line. I was, hey, we're after, uh, we're after the was, statutory. Um, Time yeah, frame. Yeah, yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a bit of a grey line there between absolute, uh, you know, equity, cell side equity research and research to support raises. But um, uh, I, never, Always I, never saw, I never saw that line. Um, others may have. But, uh, yeah, you just got told that you need to write a research that's paper. That's right. Well, I was, I was relatively junior, so I wasn't, uh, I didn't get anywhere near some of those deals. But I was just trying to make a head nor tail of um, you know, the copper industry and, uh, and whether BHP was a buy or sell. Mm. It was hard enough. Was it? <laughs> did it ever? Did you ever land on some um, some good speckies? Uh, no, not really. I got the safe sort of bulk miners and um, oh. and base metal stocks. Um, no, you know this was this was um, this was uh, just heading into uh, the internet craze, the year two thousand, where uh, you know stocks were about vaporware. You know, yep. the more vapor the more successful, the more money you could make. and All about a good I, story. I was out there pitching, you know, you know, industrial, you know, mining stocks. Not, not very, very in favour relative to an internet stock. No, not at all. Mm. Is I, was it? In, I was in New York in, in, in uh, early 2000 when it was probably at its peak. Um, oh, you were a part of, of it, right? Uh, well, in terms of marketing, so, you know, doing mm. research, you would generally go out and market it to institutional investors. Mm. Um, you know, why, you know, we did tours of the States and, and Asia pitching to institutional investors who were, you know, these people were focused on mining, global mm. mining, um, uh, you know, and why They'd they be should... like, do you do any internet mining? Or, no, you know, well, it's... they were working with colleagues, of course, who were buying the, the vaporware stuff. So, yeah. y- you know, we all felt a bit left out, you know, like, you know, it's, we're, it's, not that we're cool, old world, we? we're selling old world, you know, and, uh, and our colleagues are working on this really cool stuff that's got something to do with something called the internet. You know, you don't need revenue to be successful. It's a good, isn't that <laughs> a good story? Believed, but everyone believed it. <laughs> I mean, I lived in that period. Everyone believed it. Everyone bought those stories. But I guess um, things balanced out over a few months after that. Yes, sort of, that's right. You, well, you, was, you came back on top. Oh, we've got revenue. We um, <laughs> Our stock price has stabilised. <laughs> well, of course, 2001. Uh, it's funny, you know, my, my career, uh, which has changed a few times, uh, has been um, buttressed by uh, major global disasters. Um, so I joined the oil industry uh, when the Exxon Valdez um, mm-hmm. occurred. It spilled oil into Prince William Sound in Alaska. Um, that was uh, only months after I started my career. Oh, okay. um, I joined uh, Standard & Poor's after my very brief stockbroking career um, just months before the 9-11 Event. What got you into advisor ratings then? Because you guys have been exposed to a lot of other startups while. Yeah, well, well absolutely. We've just um, nice lead in there. <laughs> We've just launched our. Um, uh, we're calling you know it's a horrible term, but our robo register. Um, We've mm-hmm. just launched that that last week. Um, Thirty six, uh, you know, B two C direct to consumer. Um, digital mm. solutions, not just most of them are actually not advice solutions. They're uh, budgeting tools and um, investing tools. But um, uh, so, yes, that's been really enjoyable working with those startups. I mm. mean, they're truly startups. We are too. We like to think of ourselves at advisor ratings as being more scale up now, but um, it's a far cry from uh, my my working life, which has been largely in big global Oh, that's been pretty exciting, so, like then. I'm loving it. Um, yeah. You know, cutting edge. I mean, you could, we've got a great little team. Um, you can get stuff done. Mm. You know, you can be really responsive. Um, you've got no excuses, actually, not to be highly responsive to what you're hearing. You know, w- when customers, clients, partners, um, uh, and, and in our context, I'm talking to advisors, licensees, consumers, obviously, because we have an interface to consumers and, of course, all the manufacturers, all the vendors. Mm. Um, you know, I'm talking to them all the time. They're in a, interacting with us all the time. Um, you can truly be responsive, you know, unlike a big machine, an organization that that information goes in one end and, and, and it's like Chinese whispers, you know, yep. 20 people process it through an organization. And as long as out. nothing actually happens at the end, they've done their job. Well, it, it, if something <laughs> happens, it comes out looking very different. You know, I'm trying to think of those well, cartoons, the, attention was, are, yeah. the, the 10 legged stool or the, you know, the swing that doesn't swing from the tree yep. any longer. Uh, <laughs> I could think of some more appropriate ones, but um, they're not very nice to say. We're very round kind <laughs> to the uh, big institutions, aren't we? Hey, 
I we try to we try to be nice to everybody, um, but they bring it on themselves sometimes. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> but the um, I, I what was the adjustment like? Because you think about that sort of cultural difference. It's um, how was how was that change for you? Was it was it just like, oh, I can actually just operate like a proper person now. I can. I, I want to do something and something happens and did think, you just feel uh, freedom? Or? Uh, well, I think every, uh, I've, ever since I left Exxon, um, I've been getting closer to this role um, in, in the sense that, uh, I mean, moving into, you know, self-side research, you are, you are every hour of every day, you're having to come up with ideas and, and research and content that's saleable. Um, that someone might believe and then pitching it. Um, and you, you're even though you're working for an institutional brand, I was with BT, you, you're essentially pitching your ideas. It's your brand. And, and, and so you're living, you know, living and dying by what you produce every day. Um, and ever since then, moving back into sort of more corporate roles, there's still been startup businesses um, inside the sort of security blanket of a big institution, yeah. but it's truly startups, and I've pursued those. So um, jumping into uh, advisor ratings, um, it's not that foreign. Mm -hmm. um, don't have access to the same level of resources, mm. um, and there isn't the the safety net, if you like. You know, if you get it wrong, you really, you know, it could be company destroying, yep. um, business destroying. So um, Is that, that what that makes it more you, exciting. That keeps you. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it <laughs> keeps you uh, sharp. I've never really suffered from. Uh, I think a lazy eye. I think I've always been really focused on on what's important, but boy, it, it sharpens your attention in a Well, in especially a like some of the conversations you're having with like um, people that are very directly related to the legislation that may come out in the future. Um, that's, it's definitely a fine line to walk between um, advocacy, mm. um, I guess business interests, and then like trying to balance, because you guys like- yeah. A lot of people would go, oh, if only I got in front of um, these people to tell them what it's like or what it is. Yeah. Being, I'm presuming being that close to some of these conversations doesn't make things, you don't feel any, um, any more able to um, solve some of the problems as maybe people that aren't at those conversations. Yeah, there was actually several things in that question. It's a really interesting question, actually. Um, <laughs> I'd like, like to load them up. I know. I'm trying to think which one I'd tackle first. Um you know, you know, I think it, it is a difficult balance. We're, we're like a, you know, we're a marketplace, you know, um, that's how we think of ourselves as advisor ratings, a, a consumer today. It's a, what, what most people can see is a consumer marketplace where we bring consumers and advisors together, like a bridge to the industry. Um, we're increasingly building out our, our footprint into uh, marketplaces with advisors and licensees between advisors and vendors mm -hmm. um, around the education space. You know, we're, these are all sort of things we're working on. Um, and bec by virtue of that, um, we're having conversations like you led, you know, with, with, with a number of interesting groups. I mean, you know, we've been talking to, uh, uh, we, we work with ASIC, um, clearly. We, we take an ASIC feed. I mean, the core of our data is coming from ASIC. Mm -hmm. um, it's important. I think that we show the best data. So we've had conversations with ASIC about how we're improving their data. Um, we've been talking to Treasury um, about the things that are going on around the Royal Commission uh, as they're talking to lots of people. Mm. Um, we talk to um, other stakeholders uh, like the industry associations, you know, always staying uh, close to the FPA and AFA, um, the SMSFA, um, uh, we've been talking to uh, a range of groups, actually. One of the things we're rolling out are uh, ratings on licensees, mm. right? Um, we started this work, you know, we'd like to think we're original here. We started this work before the Royal Commission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> before the Royal Commission sort of pointed out that um, there probably needs a little bit more scrutiny placed on the way these businesses operate. It's um, really smoothed out that um, the friction that advisor agents originally had. Because there's a lot of there's quite a bit of pushback originally about these sort of concepts because, like, oh, well, don't tell everyone like what we're like. Yeah, well, you know, see, when you've uh, the way I like to say to people, when you've lived at a rating agency like I did for eleven years, Standard mm -hmm. Poor's, um, you know, you believe everything can be rated. You truly do, even mm -hmm. though you know at S and P we were rating obviously. Uh, bonds, you know, credit ratings on, on bond issues and stuff like that. I was running a business that was rating fund managers and, and managed funds. But, but you know, it just gets into your blood and your DNA. And um, as I was leaving S&P, um, 
uh, the last thing I did, sort of just you know, doodling on the train and, and, and with some spare time on the way out, I actually wrote criteria to rate financial advisors. Um, now we were a long way away from. Was that touch- your was that your um, your was, CV going off to Angus? Going? <laughs> well, I didn't see Angus. I didn't meet Angus for another five years. Oh wow! <laughs> so what was on yeah. this piece of paper that? Oh, it was actually well, it was a classic S and P piece of work. It was um, it was overly engineered. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, it was yeah, several pages long. When when but, Mark uh, says it was a it was a piece of paper, he actually meant a Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> it was a piece of paper <laughs> with macros. <laughs> it, would, uh, it was a piece of paper. <laughs> I always. Used a notebook. Uh, it was a piece of paper, but um, uh, yeah. So um, I've lost my train of thought. It was about yeah having everything can be rated. So I always had a view when I joined uh, uh, advisor ratings that we needed to do more to sort of bring you know a very confusing and fast changing world uh, into sharper focus. And, and while we have customers rating advisors, we have our own rating on advisors. Um, I felt that we needed to to improve the rating on advisors. We need to increase the depth and in, in intelligence and perspective from consumers rating about, and we needed to rate something that wasn't being rated, mm-hmm. which are licensees. And and again, I think we've been vindicated by the Royal Commission. Um, and in and in building out this service, we've been talking to you know all the stakeholders that I've mentioned and many others. Um, trying it's to get nice just being the the people. We just look at the data. Um, like I, you might not like the data, but that's all we're looking at here. Like, we're... well, as much as it can, it needs to be objective like that. Yeah, yeah exactly. that really does. I mean, the data speaks, right? Um, <laughs> but you've still got to do uh, some interpretation. Well, it's like uh, that sell side research that. sometimes, isn't it? It's like <laughs> 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 some of the um, some of the algorithms. If you just play around with them, <laughs> well, if you're going to do the work, you, you've ultimately got to differentiate. Good from bad. I mean, there's no mm. point doing it otherwise. Um, you know, otherwise it's a complete waste of time. Everyone's time. Um, it, we're, we're trading. There's a continuum of good to bad in everything, yep. right? And uh, measurement is just about separating that. And uh, and so that's what we're aiming to do. Has there been a what's what's the your perspective on what was important when you started in the role to now? Has that changed much? Um, well, the realities of uh, of running a business as opposed to running a consumer marketplace. So, you know, well, are- I mean more in terms of assessing advisors, like what, what, what the metrics were around that. So if you think, even yeah. think about that original sort of the criteria cons- that yeah, I wrote. you came up with. Um, well, I think, I definitely think uh, to, to, to ultimately rate, to, to add a better rating on advisors, we, we must do what we're going to do, which is go up and rate the licensees. First, okay, because um, I think our view is that um, uh, a significant component of uh, the rating we're putting on the licensee is the best way to describe it to people because everyone wants to know what the criteria is. Well, we haven't written the criteria yet. Mm. We're still at a sort of the big sort of moving parts level. But I say we're, we're trying to assess is the licensee creating the right environment for an advisor to do their best work mm. um, in the best interest of the client. I mean, that's essentially... Um, we're doing an environmental assessment, and and if we've got that right, then we know the advisor's got a really good chance of of doing good work. Um, we what think, sort of we factors? think majority of advisors um, uh, are doing great work, are trying to do the right thing, have the best interests in mind, but they're also somewhat hamstrung by the the services that are being provided to them you know when i say hamstrung that's a, that's got a negative connotation they are slow down significantly dependent on those services yep. right i mean if it's and a if technology they're shit, then... if they're poor then then there's not much they can do about that yeah. other than move mm. right and we know they're moving in high numbers <laughs> yeah well actually yeah what what do those numbers look like in terms of acceleration of uh, migration between uh, licenses. Yeah, well, it is accelerating. So, um, you know, I don't have the the latest and greatest numbers, but certainly, uh, you know, the way I think of it. So, we had put it this way, um, sort of year to date. So, you know, to where we are today in two thousand and nineteen, um, uh, advisors are moving um, uh, sort of about thirty percent per year. Now, when I say thirty percent, I'm talking about. Then we sort of see there are twenty four thousand registered advisors. We think of uh, there being like 20,000 active advisors. So 30% of those 20,000 are moving. Um, now they're either leaving the industry mm-hmm. uh, or they're changing licensee. And it's about 
two to one. So uh, for every mm. advisor who's changing licensee but staying in the industry, two are leaving. Now that is up by 50% roughly on the last three years. That's, so um, it is really, mm. really stepped up. And we're just about to sort of, we're on the cusp of the education changes, I guess, as well. Yeah, well, I think the, the people are front running those changes. Mm. Um, you know, this, this probably really picked up um, sort of back end of quarter one this year uh, and then really just absolutely took off through the Royal Commission hearings in April. Mm. Um, I mean, clearly it's, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, we're, we're hearing from the Royal Commission that, you know, FASI is going to be biting harder than it ever did. Mm. You know, the introduction, sorry, not FASI, FOFA, the introduction of FOFA several years ago led to acceleration of exits. Mm. Um, so from 2015, 16, 17, we saw... Um, a rate of departure from the industry that was several times higher than the years prior to that. So FOFA already drove exits. Mm. Now we've got a combination of FOFA being more diligently applied combined with FASIA mm. being rolled out. Public we don't perception know what change. Form. We don't know what form, but you know, all those things are now combining. It's and, probably and one of the biggest unknowns going around. Like it's Absolutely. Sort of, people are probably more um, sure about what the Royal Commission is going to come out with than, than FASIA. That's right. The <laughs> known unknowns. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we know, we that, know, we know the about... Royal Commission is going to be nasty, whatever comes out of it. <laughs> well, the... I mean, I, I, I worry about, um, you know, with so much change impacting our industry, um, the one thing that concerns me is that at a time when we all want certainty, right, because we're all running businesses, even if you're an advisor running your own business, mm. you're running a business. And if you're a, a practice owner, if you're a licensee, if you're a vendor servicing the market, if you're advisor ratings, I think we all got stuff to do, right? We've got, we want certainty, um, uh, whatever that might be, changing our value prop, um, recoding our platform, um, you know, changing collateral, um, getting some education. Um, we just want certain. And I just really worry about what might happen if um, if we have a change of government next year and uh, what that will mean to to the kind of legislation that's going to be um, mm. uh, put on hold. Um, well, you're going to get like a, there's going to be the recommendation that comes out and obviously interpretation at that point in time. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's the chance if it does, is a change of government for how that's then taken on. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to be a, a doomsayer, a scaremonger, but it, but it just essentially it you're saying plan me. for the worst, <laughs> yeah. aren't you, mate? Well, I think you should always do that. <laughs> That's something I've learned going into startup land: is uh, plan yes. for the worst, hope for the best, plan for longer time frames, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no, no. You live, you live, uh, you live and die by by the minute in a startup. Um, okay. Plan for short time frames, but don't be surprised if they go. It takes longer than was intended. Yes, that's what you're trying. Yeah. I agree with that. That's right. <laughs> Try to do everything really quickly, <laughs> and then if it takes longer, then well, it's. That's but you're still it probably overachieved, right? Because, exactly. Uh, it's all relative. Still, it's relative to. I don't know what it's relative to a, a, a big institution. Yeah. You're still moving a lot faster. Yeah. All it takes is talking to a couple of friends that talk in a bigger business, and all of a sudden you're like, okay. It's Puts it in bad. perspective. Yeah. yeah. I achieved. Feel, makes you feel better. I didn't go anywhere, but I, I went I went further than, <laughs> than they did. <laughs> than <or>? they did. <laughs> <laughs> or if I tried the same thing in their world. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I'm, I'm being reminded by that all the time. I think I think it's interesting, you know, when you're, um, you know, because we talk to, I'm talking to all the big organizations, you know, fund managers, super funds, life companies, um, and you're constantly remind. You see people in those organisations. Uh, I was them. I was. I was that person. Mm. Um, and to get decisions made, you know, as as much as they're trying with their best intention, mm. they've still got this this massive apparatus behind them. You know, and and it, you know, it's the reality of institutional life. You know, yeah. whether decision it's, making, whether is it's slow. government or it doesn't matter. Commercial, yeah. it, exactly, it doesn't matter. It's just if you know. I like an agile world. I, I like. Yeah, you know, you're being able to move quickly. Yeah. Oh, you're in the right spot for it. Yeah. <laughs> what do you What do you think's gonna like if you if you could you, you're across a lot of things, and I understand it's um, anything you may say is, is it's obviously quite a sensitive thing to with some of the discussions you're having. But what do you see as some of the the recipes for really um, giving that certainty again, um, or settling things down? And um, achieving, I guess uh, there's a lot of intent with all these changes that have come. And the intent yeah. sometimes is not what it's sort of pertained to be. So the intent is sometimes to actually restructure things for certain reasons. Yeah. But 
um, if you take the intent to be a better financial advice industry yeah. Yeah. Um, or profession, what are, what are some of the things that you would just pull out that maybe you could simplify the, the thinking around this space? Um, we sort of need one of those crystal balls here. Um, I, I think... Uh, oh, okay. The reason you're on is because I thought you had the answers. Uh, no, I... I, <laughs> I, I think... I think I always keep in mind the fact that the you know, governments of the day, um, you know, are trying to appease vote, v- voters. Um, uh, in, a, in an advice context or a wealth context, they, they want to improve access and affordability to advice, right? And and advice in a, in the broader sense of it, I think you know, as a as a as a as a industry of people who are delivering advice, um, we we know the industry is only servicing a small part. Right of the community, um, they are by nature variably high net worth, self managed super funds, um, and the industry has designed itself around those people. Right, um, but there are so many people beyond that who who could benefit from some kind of help, and and I use that word help carefully as opposed to advice. Mm. You know, and and I, and I know there are lots of advisors trying to think about ways of reengineering their businesses. Um, I've seen some uh, an amazing uh, some amazing. Um, businesses, typically young millennials, you know, setting up businesses that are that are incredibly focused. I went to one of your events, you know, mm. niching the niche. I think it was called. That was a great one. I, I thought it's fantastic. Yeah. You know, really focused on um, being something to a group of people, a, a customer group, mm. um, or being online only. For mm. instance, uh, you know, is that specialization that's going to help them be successful businesses? But I think it's going to uh, to if that keep, continues, we're going to start servicing groups that aren't being serviced today, bringing them in. And it could be bringing them in online. So, you know, bringing them in, uh, you know, opening that funnel by uh, sourcing people who have traditionally not been touched by advice, sourcing them through online channels. Mm-hmm. That's why we launched the robo, again, I hate that term, robo register, mm-hmm. um, is to improve the funnel to bring uh, average Australians to the table. Mm. Or um, engage so with their money. Engage in some way, you know. So it could be cash on budgeting advice. It could be you know, d- you know, advice around debt, you know, reducing, consolidating your debts and paying down debt. Um, it may have nothing to do with investing. It might be post-investing. It might be you know, transition retirement, finding a nursing home, aged care, um, pension. Um, I mean, all these sort of specialty areas that mm. are not say about investing money. Um, so yeah, I think definitely. it's accessibility, affordability. That's what's, I think, informing Royal Commission informing Treasury, who's advising Royal Commission, informing the kind of uh, way in which legislators and government are thinking. Um, So building trust by removing conflict, improving affordability, improving accessibility so more people get helped. I think... And I mean, what's the ultimate outcome of that? It's it's unloading um, pressure on the public purse. I mean, it's removing, you know, it's reducing pressure on Centrelink, it's reducing pressure on Absolutely. age pension. I mean, it's all those things, right? They're the what's long that, term. Well, it's payoffs. really talk- <laughs> like the, you'd, you'd think that sort of stuff would be talked about a bit more often because that is the outcome. We never get that far, do we? In the no, conversation, it doesn't. I mean, like I've, 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 <laughs> I've put things together. I remember I went for like some sort of competition years ago, and I was like, well. Yeah, the reason I, I did a bit of cancer council pro bono work, and I'm sitting there, I'm going, this is this is too late, like like these people need help, yeah, but it's it's after the fact of when they should have had cover, and then all the the dependencies going on you're the mop, system, you're mopping up, aren't you're mopping you? up, it's, and I was like, I I, I hated it, I yeah. literally hate it, like you're helping people, and these people needed help, yeah, but. It's just really you can see the system failing. So how, there. how do you get in, so? How do you get ahead of that? That's that's I think the thing, mm. thing that, and, and and it may not be the traditional advisor who whose job is to do that. But mm. but I think again, I, it's not the panacea. You know, I, I do like to talk about this online um, community of solutions, uh, tools, and stuff. Um, it's not clearly not the panacea, but it's a great start. And 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 the more creative people are out there designing these things and. St- solving specific problems, um, we can maybe start getting ahead of some of these sort of pervasive well, What issues. do you think about um, government um, incentives for financial advice? <laughs> yeah. That's that's always been one of my ideas. I'm like, fuck, they give it for everything else. You, you, you mean, get solar. You mean tax deductibility. You on, get money. Yeah. Well, that's one. Yeah. That's probably the the more, the less direct one. Yeah. Um, still a good idea. Yeah. That's, that's the closest I think yeah. we could ever get to something. But even more than that, you get grants for- Solar panels, <laughs> and that's saving 
that's saving some stuff. It's saving greenhouse gases. It's um, hmm. So um, I get that one. <laughs> hey, we're talking about public policy, utilitarianism, yeah. the benefit of all. And if we um, if we get people with um, the right amount of insurance cover in place, even if you just scope it to that, like it, Could it be. yeah. Well, it, look. Um, I'm not going to get you to hang your hat on anything no, here, I, right? I, but I, uh, just throwing yeah, it out there. Getting into, into public policy. <laughs> Absolutely. I'll, I'll do more of the talking now so you can stay out of trouble. <laughs> I, I think tax deductibility is a good start. You know, I don't know, I don't, you know, how how um, how uh, effective is that? Um, how well known? Is mm. it even, you know, do, do, again, if people aren't even aware that they need help, um, don't know how to get help. Um, I mean, all those blockers for getting advice, you know, mm. I don't think I'm worthy of it. I'm not smart enough. I'm not rich enough. Yep. I'm not earning enough. I don't trust the community. Um, I wonder if they knew if they had a tax deduction around that, they might. <laughs> People love a tax deduction. Everyone loves a tax I'll deduction. I'll tell you what, you never get that much engagement. Out of, it makes you want to think about being an accountant because, like, that's, that's when they get excited. Yep. Get me more money yep. back from the All government. All that work you're doing around deductibility of uniforms and, you know, travelling to and from work and uh, and keeping logbooks and stuff like that, you know, the help. <laughs> some well financial advice. advice. <laughs> some well play. There, there's a new advertisement <laughs> angle. We've just come up with a marketing strategy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> hey, well, the government's got to come along to the party on that one. But what I, what I would say, my – what I – I see the challenge that's occurring is that the breadth of what – advisors need to cover is too broad for what is possible without some without super duper magnificent support around them mm. and that is the issue that um, I think advisors in the pre- profession deals with um, compared to other professions closest is probably doctors but they've got they've got support a lot of them they've got infrastructure around them mm. a lot of advisors are operating closest thing is a licensee mm. Um, there's a lot of differences in what comes out of licensees and supportive advisors. Yeah. And even just if you look with support infrastructure, you're communicating with people and you, your reference point is so broad mm. that I, I just don't think it's possible to really, if they continue to refine, it's, it's, it's in conflict with making advice more accessible. Well, it's, yeah, I think it's... Not directly, no, no, but no, indirectly. No, yeah, no, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, as we're sort of setting up to rate licensees, um, we're starting to dig into you know the way these businesses are structured. Um, we're getting into how they're changing right now. You know how they're uh, adapting their value propositions to advisors, um, and so you're seeing different types of responses, uh, which which aren't necessarily things that have just happened now. I mean, they've been working on them for some time, but. To your point, um, the advisor needs more support than ever in some ways because you're right, it's a complex world. I mean, you've got to be across so much. This goes back to the specialisation again. If mm. you, you know, you're niching the niche event. Uh, yep. I remember some of yeah. the speakers, you know, were uh, one one gentleman was just doing life insurance. Yeah. You know, um, uh, the, the niching was more around a, a, a segment of mm. client type, yep. uh, but provide them all kinds of advice. Um, it depends how you want it. But that's trying to minimise the span of control or the, the level of uh, areas that you the need breadth. to be, yeah. uh, breadth you've got to be technically across. But I'm also seeing in these groups, um, and you'd be familiar with this, um, you know, the kind of uh, coaching uh, and, and support staff that are now being introduced to some of these dealer groups to, mm. for instance, um, you know, coaching around... Uh, or coaching around coaching, coaching around uh, advisors being able to mentor uh, their clients, um, goal setting at the front end, um, skills coaching around running your business, skills coaching around running, um, you know, a technology platform, uh, a, a software platform. Um, you know, so there's more asset, more people and costs being pumped into uh, helping and support the advisor doing their job, their day job. Do you, uh, I don't know where it ends. Do you think... <laughs> I, I, I do think technology is the answer to all the problems um, in one way or the other. And I think it's the only thing that can actually help close these gaps in human capability, whether it's gaps from an individual standpoint or gaps in an organisational support standpoint in mm. terms of when we're talking about organisations working towards with the number of people involved, um, sort of a lot of chefs in the kitchen yeah. not quite getting there because yeah. it's challenging for people to work together sometimes. Yeah. But that's... Um I agree with you. I mean, and, and the technology uh, is exploding. I think um, 
you know, I really like the, the net wealth report that they produce mm. on, on, on all the B to, largely B2B technology solutions, SaaS solutions, you know, their back office, middle office, and increasingly front office in helping an advisor engage with a, a, a consumer, a client. Um, and then there's, you know, there's software that connects the software, yep. <laughs> you know, uh. project management workflow. Um, and, uh, you know, it's an extraordinary universe uh, growing and, and they'll continue to grow. We'll get, we'll get 10 of every type of tool and software. And, and so navigating that, you know, again, that's in a itself. challenge. That's that a in itself. itself. <laughs> Working out what do you need in your business? Um, there are five pieces of technology that you need. Again, I remember... Um, uh, an advisor uh, with one of these new modern businesses um, speaking at uh, at a, a conference recently, and uh, you know they reeled off na- ten different technology tool sets that they were using in their business, and uh, quite surprising, I, I knew all of them, but I would well imagine done. for most people in the audience, they they would have never heard of them. Um, yeah, there's and some big gaps. That's there, that's yeah. the future, and I think uh, it's not going to solve all all the problems. I I, I I'm thinking. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful if you were, uh, because that's essentially, you know, automating manual process, um, mm. manual steps, um, physical physical steps, paper-based systems. I was thinking, wouldn't it be wonderful to also have um, a robotic uh, uh, replacement of a tech services team? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, I reckon um, that's But the tech services team maybe don't think that like that, but um, <laughs> isn't that one of, I mean, you're an advisor, isn't that one of the most challenging areas is staying across the the it's the knowledge piece, right? It's, it's what's the latest legislation? What the changes that what, come these through? These nuances, yeah, the changes, the, the nuancing in the in the client need, and um, it's I like wish, an online Wikipedia more... that just you just you, you know it does it for you. I wish it was more about the the technical sometimes because that that I think that's more understandable. <laughs> but when you when you look at what a lot of advisors, the state. Of affairs in terms of what they are more concerned about, it's actually, and you're probably getting it come through in your data. It's it's just are they doing the right thing by compliance, mm. and it's and it's purely because and these are great advisors that have been in the great thing for a long time, and they don't know what the right thing is to do. Yeah. They don't know if they do this one thing, um, what's going to happen yeah. if they're going to get completely screwed by some sort of little rule down the track. And that environment is not very good for an advisor to be showing up and giving the best service to their clients yeah. and building a great business. Like it's just, it's a, it's a climate of fear. I know. What, you know, I think there's going to be a lot more scrutiny too, you know, more than we're already getting, right, um, by, by the regulator ASIC on <clears throat> best interest test, safe harbour. Um, and so technology, you said it earlier, I think you're right, the, the, the systems um, have to make it foolproof. Mm. To, to to ensure compliance. And, of course, um, ASIC and, and the organisations who are licensed uh, are increasingly compelled to be able to report real-time on compliance. So it's not this, you know, 12-month rear-view mirror sampling rate of 3%, 5% yep. on, on SOA compliance. It's, it's real-time. I mean, that's a massive – it's a paradigm shift. Mm. Um, so you can only do that with technology. But you think I just I just get frustrated about how much effort's been gone gone into this retrospective sort of checking process. Why don't we just have better technology to I actually know. do it I at know. the time? And it sort of takes the soul out of the oh my out, out of the out of the, the art. How about the all this amazing technology that's been designed to and they poured millions into it to like retrospectively check things? All well, we needed is the right stuff up front, and then you wouldn't even have to worry about that. Yeah. Well, again, I, I think some of the um, some of the the investment in in people who are helping coach the right behaviours um, <clears throat> are about trying to get ahead of the curve, mm. trying to be proactive. So, so so advisors are are uh, not allowed to fail. You know, they're, they're, so there's the technology which is mm. more a, a checking mechanism, um, real time. But I can see uh, more effort going into trying to school and coach advisors to do the right thing. You know, even mm. though they're trying to, mm. some of these some of the Places they fall over are very technical. Mm. I mean, you know, they're they're, they're very technical, right? I mean, uh, ASIC service uh, shadow shopping, you know, identifying something like ninety percent of you know advice that was shadow shopped wasn't compliant. Mm. Um, that's a very technical. That's an that's a definition at law. You know, well, that, not compliant, but um, and it looks bad. Right? The does, optics, the optics not the are best terrible. Stats. They're not great stats. Not You're, great headlines. Like it's. Um, uh, but be, I, I feel, and I don't know, I haven't looked at the that work, but I feel that behind that 
um, are people trying to do the right thing and deliver you know, advice in the best interest, but but they're falling over on a, on a range of technicalities that, that they can solve, you know, mm-hmm. that they need to. They need to take the action to solve it um, and, and, and change that headline. Mm. Well, I think um, I'm sure in your past roles and whenever you had a problem in the business, you'd probably go, um, what went wrong? What was the process behind that was an issue? And I, I think the source of a lot of it, um, I guess the solving of these problems is also, it, it goes down to process. And I'm an engineer. I love process. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to agree with you. I think there's a few, <laughs> a few guys out there and, and girls that um, wouldn't mind having Mark in their business um, as a compliance manager or something. Oh, so. no, don't do that. <laughs> I know some really good compliance managers. <laughs> I don't want to be one. <laughs> well, there's always, I'm sure there's always a... I think you've got to have a great compliance manager. They're your best friend. Um, they are, yeah. You just don't want to spend too I, much time with them. But that's I it. have always <laughs> kept my compliance managers close to me. <laughs> They'll tell you what's up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, we 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 needed. We had uh, when uh, you know Standard and Poor's uh, post post the global financial crisis um, uh, became uh, uh, rating agents became licensed. Uh, they weren't they weren't licensed ah uh, because before. of the credit defaults. Everything that came out of the GFC, you know, credit rating agencies became licensed. Yeah. So there was a massive investment uh, in compliance staff. Was it a big? Was it? A, was it actually a big change? Or oh, it was huge. Yeah. Um, I mean, they, they hired massively accounting staff. Uh, so like the, the accounting, the forensic, the accounting forensics, mm. uh, uh, they were being used around criteria development, uh, tighter criteria development. Um, but then, but a massive influx of legal and compliance people, because essentially that uh, uh, S and P in all the countries that operate and, and, and all the rating agencies, not just S and P, um, were becoming licensed. Um, yeah. Is it, this when you really came into your own? When they get there's more rules. Well, the funny thing, and the engineers just going. I like rules. Well, no, I can they, deal with them. Well, 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 no. I thought the most ironic thing was that um, running a a uh, a wealth business in Standard and Poor's, and we were the poor cousin. You know, um, I was under no illusions around that. Um, we were already licensed. We <laughs> we were licensed. We were this little entity inside S and P that that understood license, yeah. li- licensing. You the know, obligations, the obligations and, and compliance. Um, and, uh, and in Australia, we were right across it. Um, and then, uh, all my colleagues in the rest of SP, Sunny post 2009, had to, uh, uh, cut, uh, jump into the future. So did you take on a bit of a, a teaching role in that respect? Or? Um, I just thought it was, uh, it was an ir- irony that, um, that the little, yeah, the little, little Australia was, was able to sort of share some stories and some, some sage advice. <laughs> That's usually the case. Well, Mark, uh, Thanks for coming on. It's, uh, is there anything, I guess, um, next few weeks, there's lots of things happening. Um, anything you'd like to share with the community about what's happening at Advisor Ratings? Um, yeah, I think um, we're, we're doing a capital raise at the moment. So, Anyone want to invest? Is that anyone sort of? who wants to invest? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Not retail, only wholesale. Correct, um, yep. <laughs> and significant checks, <laughs> yep. <laughs> only accepted. Um, but I think more importantly, the message being that um, we've got some really good momentum behind the business and and part of the funding is to is to roll out some of these new services. Um, but really importantly, particularly for, for the advisors listening, um, we are continuing to invest in the business um, so that they... Uh, can have a better experience on the platform, and part of that experience is bringing more consumer traffic. Right, uh, that's I call it the oxygen to our. It's the lung to our mm. business. Is mm-hmm. the consumer front end, um, and that's where we draw in the oxygen. The oxygen is our consumers. We want to bring uh, a variety of customers. Uh, you know, magnitudes uh, more, orders of magnitude more consumers to the platform to find the advisors on the platform. That'd certainly a number so, of advisors towards you a lot more, wouldn't it? Well, that's they should be. I mean, they should be online. That's how people shop today. Um, we're encouraging people, advisors, to to build out their profiles, um, but we're going to deliver by attracting more consumers. So the capital raise is to invest in things like that. Mm. Is to to start spending some some serious dollars uh, on you know above and below the line marketing, uh, SEO work, um, a- anything, uh, partnerships um, mm. inside and outside the industry. So working with uh, sort of 
luxury, good travel providers, um, uh, seniors, uh, car club, you know, out of industry kind of groups to try and attract people okay. uh, to our platform to help with advice, digital okay. or, or physical. So uh, anyone looking for clients out there, just um, Mark is doing his best to get them in front of you. Yes. Nice, nice clothes. Yeah. Let's just <laughs> run with that. <laughs> Thanks for coming on, Mark. All right. Good on you. <laughs>